I'm Mike Beckerly. I work for Owl Cyber Defense. So you'll see all these slides. They're going to have our little logo on it. Whoops, I should be fluffed this. It's already wiggling up. Um, by the way, this is actually the street I stayed on before the uh, conference. So there's just just some delightful gingerbread houses and stuff like that here in uh, New Orleans. It's really, this neighborhood is called Faubourg Martigny, and it's just to the east of the French Quarter. And it's it's just beautiful there. It's really quite lovely. Um, okay, what I'm going to talk about, this is not a presentation I've given before, and I think it's probably too long for the time allotted. So I'm going to try to go as quickly, wow, this is kind of weighty. Um, I'm going to do the fastest possible introduction to what is DFDL and what is Apache Daffodil for those who haven't heard an introduction to it before. But that's going to be the, the, the lightning talk of the sub-talk of this that's a lightning talk. What I really want to talk about is some things going on inside of Daffodil, which is Daffodil has a schema compiler for this language called DFDL, and that uses a number of functional programming techniques. It uses this technique we call out the durative lazy attribute parameters. I'll explain a little bit about that. Uh, there's some other interesting uh, functional programming stuff in there as well. Um, and then I'll jump over to talk about our new runtime environment, which is a C code generator. It uh, emits C language source code for standard compilers. And then uh, I'll just overview quickly a couple things that are going on in the project as well that are worth knowing about. So with that, um, so what is DFDL and what is Apache Daffodil? So DFDL stands for Data Format Description Language. So here's the problem. What if you got some Edifact data? That's what Edifact looks like. It's, you know, it's these records. There's a bunch of characters. They have certain meanings, different records. It's it, it, Edifact is an electronic data interchange thing. It's using commerce. What if you've got some data that's this big packed binary stuff, like that's your data, but this is how you have to interpret it. Certain bits are mean this and other bits mean that and so on. Or what if you have NACHA data? NACHA is a credit card transaction format, uh, and he, this is a small piece of very artificial NACHA data. Uh, ISO 853, another card format. You first look at this and you say, oh, that looks like hexadecimal, but no, it's not because there's actually strings in it. Right, so this is a hex, but you know you see a lot of, you know, it's a it's a complicated little format full of flags and and so forth. So, um, so Daffodil is about that problem. Uh, DFDL stands for Data Form Description Language. It's a standard from a little known group called the Open Grid Forum. Uh, I started working on it a long, long time ago, a whole lifetime ago, uh, in 2001 with some other people uh, at IBM. Uh, it was ratified this year, finally. It's a fairly big document. It's like a 200-page standard, 200-something pages. Um, but a little confusing is some people look at the acronym DFDL and pronounce it Daffodil. But we also named the Apache project Daffodil. So it can be a little confusing. I will mostly say DFDL when I mean the language and Daffodil when I mean the software. Now, DFDL is a standard it's mostly not new ideas. It standardizes existing practice from data integration tools uh, from the time frame around 1995 to 2010, and basically tries to be a union of these things. By the way, I will publish these slides so you'll be able to get there. And they're also, they're, they're even available for you to mess with if you wish. So, um, uh, so DFDL does have some innovations in it because the the big use case that Owl Cyber Defense is interested in this for is is information security related, and that requires not only that you parse data, which is normally what you need to bring it into some sort of decision support or database, but it also requires you to be able to re-serialize the same data, and which we call unparsing in DFDL speak. And uh, unparsing is actually quite tricky when you have stored length fields and all kinds of things like that that have to be computed and. Uh, if the data has been modified, you have to recompute those things. So it's uh, it's it's got some really innovation in that aspect of it, but most of the properties, for example, byte order and what's the character set encoding and what's the separator, those we didn't invent any of this. That stuff was all copied from existing tools um, that were in the marketplace. So it was mostly a generalized from existing practice, plus some additional innovations on the unparsing side. Uh, so, what, 
if you have Daffodil, you can convert data. So one of the things people use is use cases say, please convert my data into JSON so I can make some sense of it. So my programmers who know JSON can immediately start to access this data without having to learn everything about Nacha. Um, or maybe I want it as XML instead. I can convert users to convert data to XML. Uh, and so that's the problem it solves, the standard. I want to show you a snippet of this. So here's a little piece of data. It's got some tags and some values, all right? So R limit equals five, the five's the data, the R limit is some sort of tag, etc. cetera. Um, so it's ASCII text integers here, ASCII text floating point. It's got these syntax things, initiator, separator, another initiator for the other field. Uh, so separators, initiators, AAKA tags, Terminators, they're all examples of what DFDL calls delimiters. Delimiters are one kind of framing. Framing, uh, DFDL divides the world into content, which is the stuff that turns into values, and framing, which is the stuff that surrounds the values. Um, okay, uh, so here's an example. So a DFDL schema is actually an enhancement of an XML schema. So our little pair of two data elements there, one was an integer, one was a float, these are the logical elements. It's a complex type, which I've named R pair because the both had names that began with R. Um, so that's the backbone of the thing. And then to make it into a DFDL schema, you add stuff. Here's what you add, a block of stuff at the top that declares the properties that apply to the whole file. So the encoding is ASCII. The length kind of the field is delimited, stuff like that. Uh, and then you also put properties directly on the schema itself, the separator of this sequence is a semicolon. The initiator for this field is R limit equals psi, etc. Those are called DFDL properties, and there's a big collection of them, and that's what the 200K spec is about, is all, every, the nuance of how all those properties work and interact. So that gives you a daffodil schema, and now you have the ability to take your data, and you can parse it with a DFDL implementation, like a patching daffodil, and you get a tree which we call an info set. Um, the tree represents, is the logical representation of the data. You can also go back the other direction and unparse it back to that format. And you don't actually have to go around this cycle. You could start by creating the info set and then output it. I mean, data has to come from somewhere originally, right? So you could create it that way, but you can do whatever you want with that. And this info set is designed to be easily interchanged into XML. Uh, we now have uh, EXI, which is a binary XML thing I'll mention at the end, JSON, Apache NiFi records, Apache drill structures. That sort of stuff is easily done from here so that you can get data, given one of these descriptions, into a variety of different things. So now you know the basics. That's the, the lightning talk. What I really want to spend a little bit of time on is what's cool about how Daffodil works and the way we programmed it and what makes it fun and interesting to work on and, and so on. So, so Apache Daffodil, it's about, it's written in Scala. It contains a full blown compiler for the CFDL schemas. And that's the, that's the whole secret. How do you get type C code out? The answer is you write a compiler that generates type C code, right? Um, but, uh, it's Daffodil contains a, this compiler, it contains a JVM based runtime for parsing and unparsing. That was the first runtime we built. It includes a big test suite. We actually invented a language called test data markup language, um, which is an XML based language that allows you to put snippets of data and snippets of schema and build test cases and have them be nicely self-contained and so on. And we use that a lot as though this, the largest piece of the whole pie that makes up Daffodil is that test suite, which is 128,000 lines of that. Um, it's a, over 100 and almost 115,000 lines of Scala now. Um, it does use some very interesting functional programming techniques, which I'm going to talk about now. The C runtime is starting to be a slice of the pie now. It's pretty small still, but it's starting to get there and I'm hoping that we get to work on that more and build it out to be uh, more interesting um, over the next little while. So what do you get if you download Apache Daffodil? You get some jar libraries. They run on the Java virtual machine. It includes this DFDL schema compiler, the runtime, various utilities, this test data markup 
uh, runner. You get you as usual. You get signed jars available from Maven Central. Uh, it has a Java and a Scala API, which an API which have the usual Java doc, Scala doc. You get this new C generator backend. Today, that only handles a small subset of the DFDL language. Um, that's okay because the DFDL language actually admits subsets. One of the things that we did when we created the DFDL standard was we said, look, lots of people are not going to want to implement this whole language. It's too hard. A lot of people are going to want to implement subsets. So there's actually some, uh, some interesting subset implementations. The European Space Agency built a thing called DFDL for space, for example, for satellite data formats and stuff like that. So um, you get a command line interface that gives you an interactive command line debugger and trace facility. Uh, often the easiest way to debug these things, just print out the trace and then scroll through it and figure out what's going on. Um, you get that will output XML or JSON or new EXI um, for the parse output or the input to the unparsing, which will recreate data. And you can also get now a VS Code uh, IDE extension for Daffodil that allow you to do uh, interactive debugging. You know, you can sort of single step and watch it build the info set and so on. So there's a lot of nice stuff. So I want to talk about the compiler. So first, any compiler. Here's how compilers, the way I conceive it, work. You start with some textual syntax on the left there, and you build an abstract syntax tree by parsing that syntax. And then you enhance that abstract syntax tree, which is what these lo this loop here represents. You're just, you're just computing new things on that tree from other things that are already on that tree. Um, and eventually, since you're trying to actually turn this thing into something else, at the output, eventually you've accomplished all you can on the abstract syntax tree, so you construct a different representation, usually some other kind of tree, uh, and you do the same thing again. You continue to compute new stuff on that, uh, looking at what you've already computed, computing the new things, until that representation runs out of gas and you need to compute something else, and eventually you get to something that allows you to create what you wanted to create out, right? And typically people will organize this code into a bunch of passes, First do a few things here, then do a few more things here, a few more things here, then eventually we go over here, the next, you know, it's a bit stage with a bunch of passes. Uh, so, um, all right, so the Daffodil Schema Compiler is, uses this model very much, but it also makes a lot of leverage of functional programming techniques. In particular, we use lazy evaluation everywhere here. So we build this multi-stage translator that starts first by taking DFDL syntax and parsing it into this thing called the DFDL schema object mod. This is our abstract sy syntax tree for a DFDL schema. Uh, and then that thing has all kinds of little definitions, and I'll show you some, uh, that are different, how the compiler learns different things about the schema by looking at other parts of the the abstract syntax. Uh, and then we construct a different representation. All this stuff is then lazily. That's traversed in a in a backend which actually outputs the runtime representation. Um, so in Daffodil, what you do is you've written all this code, then you just say, uh, please see the output. And everything happens by lazy evaluation going all the way back, including reading the files. Right? So it's, it's a big functional program, uh, but it's actually quite natural to write it this way because when you're enhancing this tree, you're just computing new values based on existing things. So the new values are just functions of stuff you already know. And uh, the, function, the lazy evaluation has a nice characteristic, which is you don't have to organize anything into passes. The passes are self-organized, right? It computes things when it needs them. All right. Um, so, uh, so it's kind of uh, it's kind of fun to do it this way. I'll show you what some of this code actually looks like. Um, now, DSOM, I do not going to explain this diagram, other than to tell you that there's one very important class in the middle called term. But uh, DSOM, it, the DFDL schema object model. The reason I put this diagram up here is just to show you we have one. Okay. It's actually, there's, these classes are documented, and uh, there's Java doc for them and stuff like that. But we at least, you know, it's an orderly model. Um, 
uh, that represents a schema. It's similar to the XML schema object model that's used in a lot of Apache XML oriented projects. Not quite uh, the same thing. And it's organized for Scala and it's organized around this lazy functional programming discipline. So, um, okay. So I want to talk about one of the functional programming techniques we use, which is this thing called OOLAG, Object Oriented Lazy Attribute Grabbers. So uh, this is a functional programming idiom for writing compilers. And um, there is a paper that a guy started about this. Attribute grammars is a really old technique for organizing compilers. Um, and this guy, John, uh, Thomas Johnson, in 1995, wrote this paper called Attribute Grammars as Functional Programming because he basically said, look, this is just functional programming. Uh, and no one ever described it as that before, but it really is. Uh, if you can go and do a Wikipedia search for attribute grammar, and it will fit a pretty good explanation of what an attribute grammar is, it suffices to say you, build, you parse the syntax, you create that abstract syntax tree, our DSOM tree, uh, and then parts of it are computed in terms of other parts of it. And if you are looking bottom up at the things inside of some part of the syntax, that's called a synthetic attribute and it's rolled up from the bottom. If you're looking at the context surrounding you or the type structure or something, that's called an inherited attribute. Um, and uh, this notion of attribute has nothing to do with an XML notion of attribute. It's just an ab abstract concept. Um, and uh, it also, this notion of inherit that they use does not have to do with object orientation uh, and the notion of inherit there. So what makes it a little confusing is when you combine attribute grammars as a functional programming method with object orientation, uh, because now you have real inheritance in the object oriented sense. And you break up the code into uh, these, into what are called mix ins, or in Scala, in Scala they're called traits, and other object oriented languages and flavors they were called mix ins and, and so on. So this turns out to be a really powerful pattern for writing compilers or any kind of rich transformation. For example, I've seen the same idiom used to form a company that did mechanical design CAD by describing, you know, complex mechanical assemblies using this kind of discipline. And you could literally hit the button and it would design industrial heat exchangers for you and stuff like that. It was really quite amazing. So I've seen like whole companies formed around exploiting this pattern. Um, quite interesting. Uh, so, um, Lazy evaluation and then she avoids having to organize the compiler, strictly speaking, into passes. You do still have to stay out of your own way. It's very easy to make the mistake of defining something in terms of something, which is defined in terms of something else, but defined in terms of you again. And you get a cycle, right? Um, and um, I'll talk about uh, talk about that. But if once you don't have the once you don't have anything defined cyclically like that, then yeah, lazy evaluation will will take care of the organization of the thing for you. Um, so we have uh, the values in this OOLAG framework are these special OOLAG value objects. And they allow the answer of a computation to be one of three things. It can be an ordinary value. Uh, it can be a set of diagnostic uh, information, at least one of which is an error, which meaning you can't have a value because an error was found in your schema. Or it can be both. You can get a value and you can get a bunch of diagnostics that are only warnings. Right, they're just advising you that your schema might have problems, but they're not stopping you from compiling it. So, um, so the code in the in the DSOM part of Daffodil is organized into these OOLAG value calculations using this lazy valuation image. And there's another class called OOLAG hosts. So I'll talk about more in a minute. Basically, the OOLAG hosts are objects that are the containers for the OOLAG values, and they. Um, they answer the question of whether you're done with something, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll fill in a little bit more about that. So here's some actual snippets of Scala, if you haven't seen it. Um, so term is one of the important classes uh, in, in DFVL and in XML schema as well. A term is either an element, like an integer, uh, it has a name, or it's a group uh, which could be a sequence of things or a choice of alternatives. That's it. That's what terms are. So, um, so here's a uh, on on the class choice. Here's an example of one of our lag values. Is a thing called 
This is Scala syntax, lazy vow. Has no and required syntax. This means you will not compute this until you need it, and you're only going to compute it once. That's what Scala does for you, lazy vow. Uh, it's a Boolean, and it's defined to, to mean, uh, do we have framing? Has framing? That tells us there's some known required syntax. That means there will be bits in the data stream corresponding to this thing. Um, that's what has known required syntax is supposed to tell you that, that you, that it, that you can't have one of these things without there being some bits. And, um, so one of the ways that can happen is you can have framing like delimiter, right? Uh, alternatively, if there's no, if the choice doesn't have any framing, well, a choice is, is a set of alternatives. So for those members, those alternatives, all of them have to have known required syntax, sorry, in order for you to, to know the answer that says known required syntax. So that turns up is an abstract property defined for all terms. So there's a different definition for sequences. This is a different definition for elements, right? But they all have to define this notion of has known required syntax. Has framing, which is used over there, has this definition, which is shared by, uh, well, a bunch of the terms. I'm not sure all of them. And that just means, does it have an initiator, does it have a terminator, and does it not have no skip regions? Most commonly things have no skip regions, so that's why that's expressed that way. Um, so here's the thing that is interesting about this. There's zero bits in this code you're looking at having to do with error recovery, what happens if there is no leading skip property, etc. There's just nothing there about any of that sort of stuff. And that's, that's the beauty of this idiom is things can go wrong in here. You could have errors inside your group members. You could have properties that have to be there, but they're missing. And all of that stuff, when it goes wrong, just gets accumulated by the surrounding objects here. Um, so, uh, so for example, this, these leading and scaling trip skip properties, those are required properties. They have to be in scope or on your object. Um, if they're not there, it's an error, but the zero of this has to deal with that. So, um, it's all framework stuff. So that's one of the things that keeps this sort of clean and functional. Um, this kind of thing, by the way, this sort of known required syntax, this is sort of a semi decision, a semi, it's a halfway a predicate, right? If it's true, it means there definitely is going to be syntax for this element in the data stream. If it's false, it simply means you don't know whether it will or will, or will not have any representation, right? And compilers are full of those kinds of semi-decisions. If you know this, there's an optimization you can do. Otherwise, you don't know, so you can't do the optimization, right? So lots of, you find a lot of things, you find a lot of code in Daffodil with the word known in the key, is a keyword in the, in the name of the value, because it's, it's decide, it's telling, trying to tell you the compiler was able to learn something about your schema and therefore optimizations apply. Uh, and that's a very important part of how we get um, tight code out of a daffodil. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Okay. So, um, bootleg values, as I mentioned, leave lazy computed values, live inside of optics called bootleg hosts. All those classes that were on that class diagram uh, that I showed earlier, those are all bootleg host objects. The bootleg host is a parent class for all of those. So they all can gather up diagnostics. Uh, they also solve the problem of gathering more than one error before giving up, because there's nothing worse than this. There's, there's problems in your schema, and the first thing the compiler does is crap out on some trivial error, and you got to recompile it again to get the next error. You really want it to do the best job it can at giving you as many errors as it can um, before it gives up, so that you can fix more than one before you try to compile it again. Uh, it, handles avoiding duplicate error messages. It handles associating sort of the file and line number information with the right object to blame in the schema. You know, this property isn't there for this object, right? Um, it handles this circular definition detection problem for you. That's a developer level problem, not a user of this. If someone who's writing a schema should never see that. We see that when we blow it, when we're defining our, our, our lazy values. But, um, so it, it handles this gathering of these diagnostic objects, uh, the computation of the values, uh, it gathers, uh, and it also handles this thing, any given like host object, you can ask it, do you have any errors? Is it an error? 
that will force it to evaluate a bunch of things called the required attributes. And only if those all evaluate without accumulating errors is the object without error. So it's all sort of very demand driven. You want to know whether the objects are without error, you start at the top of the schema and you say, is this schema without error? And it says, well, that means my child objects have to be without error. And they all force certain things to happen. It all happens based on functional programming by demand. Okay, next part, next pass the compiler. How many doing on time? Oh, it has 10, 10 minutes left at least. Okay. Um, so the next pass of the compiler is where we finally construct a different representation. Again, lazily, we construct this tree of what are called gram objects. Uh, uh, again, this is a tree that's computed as a function of the DSOM tree. Um, and, uh, and again, we compute a bunch of stuff on it. Uh, gram stands for grammar tree, and it's a data grammar. It's based on a set of concepts uh, defined in the Scala um, programming language. They have this thing called Scala Combinator Parsers. It's really quite interesting. If you look at Scala Combinator Parsers, you get a big aha moment. You go, wow, this Scala thing really is pretty cool because you get to write stuff that just looks just like a grammar, and yet it's code. Um, this is essentially a little optimizer framework, a little simple, very simple optimizer framework. Here's what grammar rules look like. They're prod for production. This one is called term content body. It's part of a mixin called the model group grammar mixin. A model group is a choice or a sequence. Um, so it's, you see these tildes between the various things. These are the non-terminals of the grammar. The terminals of the grammar are these functional calls like align and fill. You write down a grammar like this, uh, and um, this is code. You can stick a breakpoint on that tilde operator. We wrote that tilde operator. It's not like a built-in. Um, you can put a breakpoint anywhere you want in here. It's, it actually runs, right? Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, and, you know, first, what does this little tilde operator mean? It just means sequential combination. First the start group statements, then the group left framing, then the group contents with the delimiters, then the group right framing, then the end group statements. And the optimizer framework is basically, it's based on the fact that these things can, the, the, the terminals and some of the productions, like this example, have guards on them. So, for example, terminator region, which we see right here in group content with delimiters, terminator region uh, depends on there being a terminator defined. If there's no terminator defined, poof, this whole thing goes away, right? And so the, it collapses away all the parts of the grammar, uh, and this is the way we avoid this thing behaving like an interpreter. If your, gram if your format doesn't have terminators in it, literally there will be nothing in the generated code having to do with termination, right? So it will, because the grammar will just squeeze it all out of here. If you're if your uh, format has no, um, if the leading skip region is defined to be line zero, that will go away. And that will be nothing in the resulting code. Um, this is all uh, backend independent optimization. Uh, so it, you, we're still not to the point where we're trying to generate any particular kind of runtime yet. We're just analyzing your schema and saying your schema does or doesn't need these different things in the way it's going to parse data. All right, so now I want to talk about the C code runtime, uh, also known as runtime two, because the other one was runtime one. Yeah, you know, reached, we can come up with a better nickname for it. This is mostly a contribution of one of our PMC members, John Adirata of GE Research. Um, so I'm telling you mostly about his work here. Um, so we looked at DFDL schema goes to DSOM, becomes a gram tree. Then it splits paths. Runtime one, which was our original runtime, is written in Scala. It traverses the grammar tree, assembles primitives and commodators, and then we serialize that out as a serialized J, as, you know, Java serialization of those objects, which you can restore and use to parse and unparse. Runtime two is quite different. It traverses the same grammar structure, but generates literally C and .c and .h files, which could compile into uh, actual code. Um, so runtime two has sort of different goals. It first is it's a restriction on the DFDL language for simplicity and performance reasons. 
Um, it's not doesn't handle backtracking. It doesn't handle uh, data that's so large it doesn't fit in memory. These are all things that we did in the runtime one that were quite hard to do. Um, and so we uh, the runtime two wanted to be simpler and really deal with things that fit in memory messages mostly. Um, it's focused really on binary data. It generates C code fast, small footprint. Um, it statically allocates everything possible. Um, this was actually a stepping stone. What people really wanted to do is generate VHDL for FPGA hardware realization of these things. That's the actual goal. Uh, they started with a C generator, right? So uh, I hope in a year to tell you about the cool 100% hard, hardware. This, by the way, the reason people want hardware is actually information security related. No, so, no stack of millions of lines of software that could be compromised in the filtering of the data and just want to get all the software up from under it, build a circuit. I'm at 10. Okay, I'm good, I think. Um, so the runtime two has a different, very different info set. The objective is for it to be even more efficient than what programmers would typically create. Uh, that lives in balance with the generality needed to handle all of DFDL. Um, this needs to be walkable. That is, it's metadata connected because she, you, you shouldn't have to know how it works in order to traverse it. Um, and, uh, he wants to be designed to work for modern processors, uh, so that it can be really fast. So, um, if you read about the new Java of the hollow the JVM design goals, this is the same sort of a design goal, uh, which is basically don't use as many pointers. So this is this typical objects with pointers. Things point to their metadata, but they also point to values. Um, it's very heap oriented. Um, uh, what we want to do instead is it's layer. All right? So this thing has beautiful behavior with respect to prefetch and, and caching and so on. So that's the objective of the design of the info set is many fewer pointer based allocations and so on. Now, this is really pretty straightforward to do if you're creating this from a parser, right? Because you could just move along. If, if there's no need to point to things and stuff, right? You, you, it's, it's pretty easy to construct this kind of an object. Um, now, the runtime two works like this. You take you get C code and H code that come out of it. You go feed it to something like GCC. You get out a .o, and that works with the runtime libraries, a bunch of primitives like read a big Indian integer, please, or read a floating point number, whatever. There's also a visitor library that allows you to traverse the data. And then there's a, a, a library that uses that visitor library in order to visit this, the structure that comes out of the parse and convert it to XML. And that's very convenient because then it plugs right into all of our test infrastructure, right? So we, we test the runtime two thing using the exact same TDML language and everything we use for the other runtime front end. So this is very good for us, um, for making sure we're doing things consistently. Um, so I want to just literally, I'm going to show you a really simple schema and then show you what some of the C code looks like. So here's a schema, two little tuples, foo and bar, and each one's a little type with this one's got three integers in it, ABC. This one's got three floating doubles in it called X, Y, and Z. Uh, and we're going to put those together in a union. Okay. We're going to make a sequence of a tag and then an element named data, which is a choice of one of those foo things and one of those or things. Right. So this is a little bit interesting, not trivial. Um, so you get out in the generated C, the two obvious structures for foo and bar, ABC and 32's XYZ doubles. Okay, and you get out a union structure. So you get this object. All these objects have the base pointer, which points to the metadata for the object. That's what allows the visitor pattern to visit it. Um, the choice, this choice object is, a, and I have to ask the guy who, John and Gerante, why this thing is of type size T. That's a quite a mystery to me. But... Um, this is the choice of which union to use. That's different from the tag. Tag is a data field. This is the decision that you make from the tag. 
So, uh, but then it's actually a regular old C union of these two types, right? So, um, and then this is the net structure with the tag and the union, that thing in it. So this is the ultimate um, uh, representation. Uh, the code that you get out for traversing it to do of, in this case, I, I chose the unparsed code. And you can see that it initializes the choice um, and then it says, okay, switch on that choice. Case zero, it's, we're going to unparse a foo instance. Case one, we're going to unparse a bar instance, right? And this is exactly the code you never want to write by hand, ever, right? This is the stuff you wanted to emit. Uh, those primitives, that unparse self there, you know, it looks like this. Three, three calls to unparse a big Indian in 32, right? So uh, pretty simple. Uh, simple, very straightforward code. There's a very straightforward um, error recovery, not recovery, but error handling idiom in, built into this as well. So we get nice tight C code out of this. Um, it's still partial. Here's the status. It's partial. It needs strings, variable length arrays. It only has very, very limited support for expressions, so you can do things like the tag calculation that was in those slides that I raced through. Um, so it's just getting off the ground, but it is doing some pretty interesting things already um, and showing that you can actually get code just as tight as what you would write by hand uh, out of Daffodil. Uh, all right, just want to tell you about a few more cool things that are in Daffodil that, that are interesting and good to know about. First is we have this VS Code debugger I mentioned. This is a data format debugger. It's a new sort of new category of thing. We've all used IDEs, but we haven't had um, things focused on data formats. So this is an extension to VS Code, and you can get it from the extension marketplace now. Um, it's a pretty small piece of code now. These numbers are, you know, a few thousand lines of code so far. Um, it does include another yet another interesting functional programming idiom. It uses this thing called type level FS2. At cat's effect, and I will admit right now, I don't understand those things yet. This is the work of another subgroup of the Apache Daffodil team, actually, um, that uh, are, took on to build a environment for Daffodil because Daffodil is pretty hard to learn without this. Here's a screenshot of it um, with VS Code. This is a schema. This is it's building the info set incrementally, highlighting where you are in the schema. And of course, there are other windows that will show you where you are in the data. It's a little hard to point out, but that's the byte it's on at the point where I took the screen snapshot. Um, so we're starting to have a, an environment to make this a lot easier to learn and use. Last thing is, um, one of the, th the things that we have in Daffodil, because it grew up out of the XML legacy, there's a lot of people who just can't stand XML. It's just too inefficient for them. They just can't stand it. And uh, so uh, a lot of people have said, well, why not use this EXI thing? So EXI is a W3C standard. It's called Efficient XML Interchange Format. It's coming in the next release of Daffodil, which will be out soon. Um, it brings all the redundancy and efficiency out of XML text, but it has the exact same information set. So you can trivially convert it back and forth to the XML text, but you can also process it without having to convert into XML text. So you can feed it to a validator and a, a XSLT transformer and various things like that without any of the overhead of the XML textual representation. And uh, this really works well for us because we had a, a, a particular example of an aircraft messaging data format. The original message we parsed in, just in this example, 174 bytes long. If you convert that with to XML text with Daffodil, you get 1,493 bytes out. It's almost a factor of 10 large, right? Factor of, you know, it's blew, it blew up a lot, right? So um, uh, if you use EXI uh, for the info set, it's 160 bytes. It's actually a smidge smaller than the original, right? Uh, but in general, it gets you right back down to the same size realm as the data you came from. And this stuff is bit-packed stuff, so it's... It's being quite efficient about that. Um, and it's also pretty low overhead to create and so on. So um, so that's one of the things that's nice. So that's the end of the presentation. We did the quick intro. I showed you some of the functional programming stuff we're doing. 
uh, and um, the idioms for that we use in the in the compilation, um, and how that allows us to generate C code now. Uh, a little bit more of the cool stuff. What I'm working on this week is um, I'm hoping to uh, work start working on that integration of Daffodil with Apache Drill actually this week because Apache Drill is very cool and uh, allows you to query data immediately. The idea that you could take a Daffodil schema and as soon as you've got that, you can start querying the data immediately is very, very interesting to a lot of people. So I'm hoping to, this in general is a big theme now, integrate Daffodil into other things because lots of people really like Daffodil, but it only starts their pro their, it solves their data problem only step one. Or at least I can get at my data now. But of course, the next thing you want to do with your data is do something with it. So. Daffodil's only solving that first step, and we have to integrate Daffodil to lots of other things so people can do more with their data. Um, and that is, that's it. If there's any time left for me to take questions, I'm happy to. Um, you can have like five minutes. Five minutes. Um, and you'll find me hanging around behind the escalators on the second floor, probably trying to get Apache Drill to work. Um, uh, or in the lobby, and I'm in and out of various sessions over the next couple of days, too. So happy to talk with anyone offline as well. Thank you very much. Tired.